Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we come before you with the prayer that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be pleasing to you in all that we think and say and do this day and always. Amen. As you may know, we are in the midst of a sermon series called Jesus for President. And many of the preceding sermons have focused on Jesus doing the unexpected. And this morning is no exception. This morning's message is the final sermon in a three-part mini-series on the subject of grace. Our first conversation focused on grace and unconditional love. Our second conversation focused on grace and radical forgiveness. And today's message is focused on grace as gratitude. Today's scripture reading from the Gospel of Matthew is mostly known for its last line, quote, many are called, but few are chosen. And we will take a minute to talk about that message. But first, this passage has a lot more to it than that one well-known last line. So let's take a moment to unpack this parable and explore what Jesus really meant by sharing this story with us. I'd like to frame our conversation in four parts. First, let's review the situation. What was going on in this parable? Then let's review the complication. What happened to change or complicate the situation? Then let's review the resolution. How was the situation and its complication resolved? And finally, and most important, let's discuss the meaning of the message for us as followers of Jesus Christ. I hope you will see that the true meaning is not what it appears to be or what you might think it is on first reading. Once again, Jesus says and does the unexpected. And that radical thought, that true meaning of the parable in the scripture is what we should celebrate. First, the situation. We learn from Jesus that a king has called a wedding reception for his son. But those who the king invited to attend the banquet have declined to attend due to the press of other more urgent or more important matters. One guest replied that he had to go visit his farm. Another guest said he had an important business commitment, and so on. The story goes that each guest refused the king's invitation. And some guests went so far as to capture the king's messengers, torture them, and then kill them. So the king retaliated. And he had those who had murdered his servants killed, and then the king burned and destroyed their city. So then the king invited anyone to attend, both good and bad. And soon the banquet hall was filled with guests. So that was the situation. But what was the complication? Jesus next tells us that the king enters the banquet hall, now filled with guests, to greet them on this very special occasion, the wedding of his son. But the king sees one guest who is not dressed properly for a wedding. So the king asks this guest, friend, how is it that you came to this celebration without being properly dressed? And the guest is speechless. He has no answer for his rudeness, no explanation for his behavior. So that is the complication of the situation. And third, we see the resolution. The king orders the guest removed from the banquet and not just escorted from the room, but the guest is bound hand and foot and thrown into the darkness where the scripture says there will be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. This peculiar phrase, the weeping and gnashing of teeth, is only mentioned in the New Testament, and then it is only referenced in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. 
but it is mentioned seven times. And the number seven is a significant number in the Bible. For biblical scholars, it represents perfection or completion. This is a topic for another day, but here's a few quick examples. After six days of creation, God rested on the seventh day. Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer, which contains seven petitions to God. There were seven statements of agony by Christ on the cross. There are seven metaphors given by Jesus to describe the path to salvation, and so on and so on. A sermon for another time, perhaps. But here, the weeping and gnashing of teeth is a metaphor for the anger and rage and frustration and disappointment, surely. That is a symbolic description of the man who was removed from the wedding celebration. And now to the heart of the matter. Jesus begins this parable with the sentence, quote, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. And the king you see is God and the son is Jesus Christ. And the parable then ends with the sentence, many are called, but few are chosen. This means that those who ignore the call, those who refuse the invitation, those who have more important things to do in life with their families or their work or other commitments in their lives will not be chosen. As Jesus says, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your spirit. And the second is like the first, to love others as you love yourselves. In our first sermon in this series on grace, we explored God's call to us to love God and others without reservation or condition or hesitation. In our second sermon on grace, we explored God's call to forgive others for their sins, just as God has forgiven us. And in this final sermon, I'd like to relate this parable of the wedding banquet to God's grace and how gratitude is what God calls us to express and to share with others in response to God's grace given to us. I heard this story about gratitude recently and I thought I might share it with you. It seems a minister saw a man enter the church one day. The minister did not recognize the man he described him as old and bent over from age and looking like a homeless person seeking shelter. Yet there was a spring in his step as he shuffled down the hallway to the chapel. The pastor was worried that he might try and steal something, so he followed the man into the chapel. And there he saw the man kneel down at the altar and bow his head in prayer. The man was only there for a few minutes, and then he rose and walked back down the aisle towards the pastor. The man had a straggly beard and a weathered and wrinkled face and was dressed in ragged clothes. But there was a twinkle in his eye, and he smiled and said hello to the pastor, and then he walked out the door. In the days that followed, the man came to the chapel every day at noon for a few minutes to pray, and then he left. And one day when the man walked by, the pastor introduced himself. The man said his name was Ben. The minister asked him where he was from, and Ben said he was working in a factory some distance away and only had 30 minutes for lunch, so he would stop by and pray for a few minutes, and then he had to get back to his job. The pastor asked Ben if he was praying for anything in particular, perhaps someone who was ill or who needed help. Ben said, no, I just pray about gratitude. My prayer is something like this. Lord, I just came by to tell you how happy I have been now that I found our friendship and you took away my sin. I don't know much about how to pray, but I think of you every day. So Jesus, 
this is me just checking in today. Now that's a prayer of gratitude, a prayer of amazing grace. As we talked about in the first sermon on grace, our invitation to the wedding banquet is grounded in the grace of God. We cannot buy our way into heaven. We cannot earn our way into heaven by good works or good behavior. And this is not to say that bad behavior is acceptable. But our salvation is based on grace alone. Or sola gratia, as the Greek translation calls it. We are saved by grace alone. We are saved only by our faith in the redeeming sacrifice of Jesus on the cross who died for our sins so that we might have eternal life in God's kingdom. Our invitation to the wedding banquet is grounded in the saving grace of God's forgiveness of our sins. And so God calls us to forgive others. As we discussed earlier, Forgiveness is a complex idea. Forgiveness is difficult. Forgiveness requires humility. Forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness requires us to admit our own faults, but it also requires us to love those who have hurt us or who have hurt those who we love. Forgiveness requires us to love those who do not love us. Just as Christ forgave all of us for his betrayal, his torture, and his murder on the cross. And finally, our invitation to the wedding banquet is based on gratitude. In the parable, the king had set the table and had prepared the royal feast. All was ready. As the scripture says, quote, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. So the king invited anyone and everyone, both those who were good and those who were bad. But the bad people were not those who were bad in modern terms. Remember, Jesus is speaking to the Jewish leaders of the day. Their understanding was that a good person is a Jew who obeyed the laws and the teachings of Moses and the Pharisees. Anyone else is bad. So Jesus is only using the words and the language of the day. And from the Bible, we know that the Jews are the chosen people. And the main idea in this parable that is that as God's chosen people, God prepared the kingdom of heaven for the Jews. But God always intended that the kingdom would be given to all, including Gentiles. As we know, the Jews refused to accept the invitation to the kingdom, and they rejected its prophets and teachers, including Jesus. This parable is a rejection of the invitation to the kingdom of heaven, and it is a metaphor for the rejection of Jesus himself. We know God does not divide people by good and bad, and as Christians, we know that we should not do so either. In truth, no one is good except God. Our responsibility as Christians is to treat all people with love and not to judge or evaluate them by worldly standards or expectations. The great contemporary theologian, Fred Rogers, of Mr. Rogers' television fame, who was an ordained Presbyterian minister, once said, there are three ways to ultimate success. The first way is to be kind. The second way is to be kind. And the third way is to be kind. And now to the wedding garment. Remember the guest who came to the banquet but was not wearing a wedding robe? Jesus continues the metaphor of his rejection by those who do not believe 
by those who reject the invitation by pointing out that all of us, every person, good or bad, Jew or Gentile, can find salvation and eternal life only through the grace of God. The king enters the banquet hall and does not reject anyone because they are bad. Instead, the king rejects the guest who is not wearing the wedding garment. This is a metaphor for salvation. As Christians, we are called to reject no one. On the contrary, God calls us to reach out to all people, to encourage them in their faith, so that the Holy Spirit would clothe each of us in the wedding robe of salvation through the redemptive grace of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's not enough to be invited and then attend the wedding. Salvation is only by the grace of God, by grace alone. So please let me summarize this parable with three thoughts. First, the wedding celebration is intended for everyone. Second, the invitation to salvation is available to everyone. And third, God provides everyone with the wedding garment. The Holy Spirit creates faith in the heart of the sinner, and through that faith, the Spirit brings forgiveness and eternal life. The wedding banquet is to be with God in heaven. God does it all. So what does gratitude have to do with it? God calls us to be grateful. God calls us to express our gratitude for the grace of God and for God's promise of eternal life. Our invitation to be on the guest list for the heavenly banquet is waiting for us. By God's grace and by expressing our gratitude for that grace. Remember the story of Ben and the gratitude he showed in his daily prayer? His daily prayer was, quote, I just came by to tell you, Lord, how happy I have been now that I found our friendship and you took away my sin. I don't know much about how to pray, but I think of you every day. So Jesus, this is me just checking in today. And one day the minister noticed that Ben did not come to the chapel to pray. And then Ben did not visit for a few days. And the minister began to worry about Ben. So he called the factory and he learned that Ben was in the hospital. And this worried the minister even more. These days, worry is at the top of our lists. We worry about illness too, like getting COVID or the flu or heart disease or cancer. We worry about the environment and global warming. We worry about politics and the outcome of our national election. We worry about safety in the wake of murders and arson and looting in our cities and villages and towns. We worry about money. We worry about our jobs or the loss of our jobs, especially with such high unemployment in just a few months time. We worry about the health and happiness of our families, our spouses and our partners and our children and our grandchildren. And we worry about our future and what will happen tomorrow. And yet we have so much to be thankful for. We sometimes take for granted the many blessings we do have, that we are safe, that we do have food and shelter and clothing, and most important, that we are loved by God and by others. At the hospital, the staff worried about Ben, but he had given them hope instead. His smiles and his joy and his gratitude were contagious. The head nurse could not understand why Ben was so happy. No one sent flowers, no one sent a card, no one called, 
no one visited him, and Ben was gravely ill. Then the minister came to visit, and he expressed the same concerns to Ben. Do you not have any family to visit you, no friends to stop by and see you? Ben smiled and said, the nurse is wrong. She could not know. He's been here all the time. Who has been here all the time, asked the pastor. And Ben replied, every day at noon, he comes to visit me here. And he sits down beside me and he takes my hand. And he leans over and he says to me, Ben, I can't tell you how happy I have been since we found our friendship and I took away your sin. I think about you always and I love to hear you pray. So Ben, this is Jesus He's just checking in today. Many people will walk in and out of our lives but only true friends will leave footprints on our hearts. Every day is a day of new beginnings, a day to give thanks for our blessings, a day to praise God from whom all blessings flow. A day to check in with Jesus and say, thank you for your friendship. You took away my sin. Amen.